China is moving rivers, literally, through mountains, under cities, and across over 3,000 kilometers of land. China is building the world's largest water diversion project, designed to shift more than 44.8 billion cubic meters of water every year from the humid south to the dry, crowded north. That's enough water to fill 18 million Olympic swimming pools. This mega system includes tunnels under the Yellow River, canals longer than highways, and pumping stations powerful enough to serve millions. So far, it's cost more than $70 billion, displaced more than 330,000 people, and already supplies Beijing and Tianjin. This is like building three Panama canals, except instead of ships, you're moving entire rivers uphill through earthquake zones. But the most ambitious part, the western route, tunneling through the fragile ecosystems of the Tibetan Plateau and internationally shared rivers, remains unbuilt. All of which makes you wonder, why is China reshaping nature on such a massive scale? And can it actually succeed? The idea goes all the way back to 1952. Chairman Mao Zedong looked at a map of China and made a bold suggestion. He said, there is more water in the south and less in the north. If possible, let's borrow some. It sounded simple enough, but making it happen? That was a whole different story. Northern China has always been dry, but it's also where most people live and where factories and cities are growing fast. Places like Beijing and Tianjin depend on underground water. But for years, people have been using it up too quickly. In some areas, the water level under Beijing dropped 5 meters every year. New wells had to go more than a kilometer deep just to find water. Meanwhile, the south had the opposite problem, too much water. Big floods, heavy rains, and fast-moving rivers caused a lot of trouble. The difference between north and south was huge. So in the 2000s, China finally took action. In 2003, the South North Water Transfer Project began. The plan was big, build three giant routes, eastern, central, and western, to bring clean water to the north. But how does it all work? and what's hidden inside this giant water-moving machine. Let's start with the eastern route. This one follows the ancient Grand Canal, a waterway with routes going back over 2,500 years. Sounds simple, right? Just reopen an old canal. Not quite. This wasn't just a restoration. It had to be modernized with powerful pumps, new tunnels, and freshly dug canals. But where does all the water come from? It starts at the Yangtze River near Yangzhou. From there, water is pushed north, even passing under the mighty Yellow River using huge underground tunnels. That's right, engineers had to build a way for one giant river to flow under another. Pretty wild. And it wasn't just one or two pumps. Along the way, they added 23 massive pumping stations, each strong enough to power a small city. Imagine that much energy being used just to move water. In total, the route stretches over 1,100 kilometers. That's like laying pipes from New York to Atlanta. When did it all start working? The eastern route began sending water to Shandong in 2014. A few years later, it reached Tianjin. Today, that means around 10 million people now have access to cleaner, safer water. That's a big win right? Well, not everything went smoothly. One major problem was pollution. The canal had to pass through some heavily polluted areas. For years, factories and farms had dumped waste into these waters. That meant the project couldn't just start moving water right away. If they did, they'd risk spreading dirty, toxic water across the country. So what did they do? They had to clean it first. Water treatment became a huge part of the job, but not everyone was convinced. 
Near Dongping Lake, fish farmers said their fish were dying, and they blamed it on polluted Yangtze water. Could this massive project actually be making things worse? At first, it was hard to tell. But later, studies showed that the overall water quality did improve. Still, it wasn't easy earning people's trust. Cleaning up years of pollution takes time, and local communities weren't always ready to believe the promises. Even with success, the project had to fight to prove itself. Now, let's move to the central route, also called the Grand Aqueduct. This is the main line of the project. It pulls water from the Danjiang Ku Reservoir on the Han River and sends it straight to Beijing. So, how does it work? This is where things get smart. Instead of using pumps, engineers found another way. They raised the dam's height, lifted the water level, and let gravity do the job. That's right, water now flows downhill over more than 1,200 kilometers without using a single engine. But was it cheap or easy to do? Not at all. It took time, money, and a lot of planning. To make space for the reservoir and canal, about 330,000 people had to move. Can you imagine entire towns being uprooted? That's exactly what happened in the provinces of Hubei and Henan. Some people say they were forced out. Others say they were promised better homes and better lives. But no matter how it happened, the cost was huge, both in money and in heartbreak. And that wasn't the only challenge. Taking water from the Han River meant there would be less water for people living downstream. So how did they plan to fix that? By building a new tunnel to bring extra water from the Three Gorges Reservoir back to the Han River. Sounds simple. It's not. This tunnel is a massive 10-year project. Once finished, it will be the longest and deepest water tunnel ever built, running one kilometer below the surface. Today, Beijing gets a third of its water from the central route. That's water for over 20 million people. It has even helped refill lakes and underground water sources around the city. That's a big win. But does that mean the job is done? Not quite. There's still the western route, the most daring and controversial part of the plan. It hasn't been built yet. This route would carry water from faraway mountain rivers in western China to the Yellow River and then northward. But here's the catch. Those rivers, like the Mekong and the Brahmaputra, don't just belong to China. They flow through countries like Vietnam, Cambodia, and India. What happens if China takes too much water from the top? It could cause big problems for people living downstream. That's why the western route is on hold. But don't think it's cancelled, just paused for now. There's also the matter of earthquakes. The western route crosses areas in the Qinghai Tibet Plateau that shake often. What happens if a big quake hits? It could trigger landslides. It could even cause the tunnels and canals to collapse. That's a huge risk for such a massive project. Then there's the money. By 2024, China had already spent over 500 billion yuan, that's more than 70 billion dollars, just on the eastern and central routes. And the costs don't stop there. Maintenance bills keep going up. So is it money well spent? Some critics say no. They believe the money should have gone to cheaper ideas like water recycling, desalination, or fixing broken city pipes. But others say those ideas aren't enough. Only something this big could solve China's water crisis. So is it worth it? Supporters say yes. They point to the good things. In Beijing, the water is cleaner now. It's softer and doesn't taste salty anymore. People no longer drink bad groundwater full of fluoride. Farmers in the north can water more crops. Big factories get the water they need. Even nature is doing better. Rivers and lakes are coming back to life, and groundwater levels are rising. But the benefits aren't equal for everyone. Some villages along the canal see the water go by, but never get a drop. Pollution is still a big threat, and because many canals are open, 
Some of the water just disappears into the air before it even reaches the people who need it. So what's being done to make things better? Experts have suggested upgrades, like covering more of the canals or using smart sensors to better control how water moves. The middle route alone has over 60 check gates, 90 diversion points, and no regulation reservoirs, making real-time control almost impossible. But changes are on the way. New digital systems now track water levels, flow speeds, and even water quality. In some areas, the system can now respond to what users need five times faster than before. Sounds like progress, right? But one big question still hangs in the air. Can China keep this project going in the long run? As the climate gets hotter, southern China is getting drier. Glaciers are melting faster. Even the powerful Yangtze River is starting to feel the strain. And if the flow gets too low, there won't be enough water to send north. And that brings us right back to where we started. China may have solved the engineering puzzle, but when it comes to nature, the final decision may not be theirs to make. So what do you think? Should China go ahead with the Western route? Or is holding back the better choice? Share your thoughts and please like, subscribe, and turn on notifications.